Hello, yogis and yoginis, and welcome to the Karmic Warrior Podcast. Wonderful to be here with you. Mantra music, or kirtan, is a growing phenomena in the West over the past decade or so as yoga has become more popular. So too has kirtan. And what most people who go to a kirtan concert will say is that it enlivens you, it lifts you up, and then it takes you on this inward journey. So my guest for the podcast today is Aliyah Gandharvika. She's a kirtan singer who's traveled the world for over a decade with her partner as the kirtan duo, The Love Keys. She's performed at thousands of events and festivals in over 15 countries. She's toured with other kirtan artists, including Shantala, Adam Bauer, and Tina Malia. And she's also a vocal coach and facilitates bhakti yoga immersions. So in today's episode, we're going to take a deep dive into the mystical world of mantra. Our program begins with a short two-minute performance by Aaliyah, which unfortunately doesn't have the best sound due to Zoom, but I decided to keep it in the podcast because you can really still feel the deep beauty of her voice and her transmission. So I hope you enjoy today's podcast. Leah Gandharvika, welcome to the Karmic Warrior Podcast. It's awesome to have you here today. Yeah, it's awesome to be here. Thank you. Yeah, and we're going to talk all about the work that you're doing as a vocal coach, uh, your work with mantra music or kirtan, as most people know about it. But I thought it'd be wonderful to just start with a song, if you'd be willing to uh, play one of your songs for us. Mm, yes. Well, this this is actually a, a very ancient mantra um, that Krishna does made famous. It's part of the Sri Agala Stotram. And to me, it's a beautiful introduction um, to this, um, this conversation we'll be having. It's all about the goddess. It's all about Kali in especially, like, especially, and it has this beautiful melody. So, yeah. Jayanti Mangala Kali Bhatra Kali Dhamani Durga Shuma Shiva for that. I feel like that was an opening of our 
of our circle. I always do that in my classes with my students. We're going to open circle with a prayer, with an invocation. And that was certainly a prayer and an invocation. And um, I wonder if you could just for the listeners sort of explain what the words, you know, a few, if you could say a few words about the words and what they mean. Well, it's, um, it's addressing the goddess um, in the form of Kali, primarily in, in the first verse. Later on, it, it switches to Durga, which, you know, according to classical Tantra, is like the toned down version of Kali um, or the official version of Kali. Uh, from other viewpoints, it could be said differently, you know, and just like to me, classical Tantra is most home. So that's why I interpret it that way. And it's um, it's addressing her in, in her different qualities, the bearer of skulls and the one who's celebrated in the nine nights, like the, you know, um, Kalaratri or the, um, yeah, the nine nights. And um, and then in the, the line that keeps repeating, it, it keeps saying like, please give me this, please give me victory, please take misery away from me. Um, so it's like, a, in a way it's, it's a prayer. A lot of mantras don't have so much semantic value, but this one is actually, in a way it's also listing things that <clears throat> that the the one who chants it would like to receive <clears throat> or is, is asking for yeah so can you uh, for instance in this particular mantra just out of curiosity could you put anything in there that you're asking for no like no, not, not it's really. specific it's specific yeah it's um it's it's I think it's about 20 27 verses um that have uh like specific things that one addresses the goddess with yeah beautiful um yeah what you're saying it, it reminds me of a different prayer um the uh the Devi the Devi Suktam which it it has a slightly different angle but here in this in the Devi Suktam mantra we um, well, the intention is to see the goddess in everything, to see the divine in everything. And so what it does, it has, it has the same structure for every ver verse apart from one word that changes, um, where, where, <laughs> so translated, it says, well, goddess who appears, you who appear in the form of, I bow to you with all of my devotion. And and, and the form it, the goddess appears in, it, you know, it, it can be as trivial as hunger, you know, or mm -hmm. it can be as holy as um, compassion. So we have all these different words. And in that case, I could imagine if the singer has a personal desire um, to, you know, if, if she or he wishes to see the goddess in a specific way, you know, they could put in a word of their choice. Yeah. 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 Cool. So what's interesting about Kirtan, at least in the last, at least couple decades, probably it's become mantra music has become a thing. Like you were, we were talking about in the green room, you were just at a festival, yoga and music and yummy food. And a lot of people associate this world with that, the festival culture and this awesome music, but the subtleties that you're describing um, are, I don't know like how many people really get that are into it because mantra music is beautiful and it just lures you in just because of the beauty of it. But the to have the music open you up to a whole different world of devotion requires some level of understanding of, of the teachings. And so I wonder for you, how, what was your journey to coming to mantra music? Like, where did you start? I know in your bio, it's like, okay, you, you um, were singing in choirs and I'm sure that was when you were younger, or, but what was that journey to this 
deeply devotional spiritual music? Well, I've always loved to sing. I've been singing over for over 30 years. And and I came to love India at a young age already as well. I was like 15, 16 when I um, felt really drawn to India and, and everything to do with India. So the moment I heard mantras for the first time, that was at the age of 17. I was like, oh, wow, they're from India. So they're cool. You know, and um, and I... I just approached the singers. They were street musicians from Sweden who I met in Spain and they were singing like these typical bhajans. And I, I recorded them and I was like, teach me all you have. Like, I, I love to learn this. And, and then like one step led to another, like I was traveling a lot at the time. And so I met another mantra musician in Scotland and I actually gave some kirtans with him. That was my entry, like at the, in my early twenties. And it, it took quite some time I actually, until I actually got deeper, like and, until I, I actually inquired about, okay, what, what are these mantras saying? Like up until then, there were beautiful melodies who came from an exotic country that I wanted to visit really badly. So um, it was really until my late 20s that I looked deeper into that and... Um, yeah, and that's kind of when the door opened much more. Yeah. So yeah. how, when you got to that point in your late twenties, and I'm assuming you then found teachings that helped you to understand the mantras or, or what was that like? And how, if so, how did your own spiritual journey and the teachings in begin to inform the the music you were singing um well i lived in germany at the time and i i have to say back then that was like 13 years ago there wasn't much that like i didn't know of any teachers there were a few books so i read everything i could get my hands on um and thank God we started touring with international mu musicians quite soon. Like we started the Love Keys in 2010 and then 2012, we, we toured with Chantala, for example, with Heather and Benji Wertheimer. And that was a huge door opener. Like from them, I learned so much about mantras and I actually came to feel, I mean, it's all about a relationship in the end with the mantra because it's it's a it's like the sound body of the deity which i came to learn later from harish from christopher harish wallace so through through this deep music that that we played at the time through touring with shantala i actually got like a visceral sense of not so much what i was singing about but who it was i was getting in touch with by reciting the mantra by singing the mantra and and the real entry point i mean we toured with a bunch of musicians like jai jagdish and tina malia and adam bauer so every time another door opened through these collaborations and then the huge big 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 door was when i met my first teacher anandra george and that was in 2018 and i started training with her she does the heart of sound teacher training and that's when I fully came to realize what it is all about. Yeah, and that was in India. So it was like just this sort of this big bang where everything finally made sense and was like, I was able to feel more than anything. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that um, that's such a beautiful journey. You speak to something that I think perhaps all people who feel drawn towards mantra music, myself included, is it's, there's this, when the musician is deeply connected in the way that you are to the mantra and, and has that type of practice, there's transmission that happens, I feel, yes. um, when I've been in the presence. And so, uh, my husband is a, classical Indian musician and 
has played tabla for 40 years. So we have lots of musicians coming into our house and we Saraswati Puja. And in that I've had <clears throat> the been blessed like you to have doors open to experience music as transmission and to have Kirtan artists come into our house and play. And um, my experience on my end, because I'm not a, like you, I'm not a, a musician, but I am on the other end of it. And my experience has been like, I don't know what the heck these words mean, but there's something way more powerful here than just singing um, as much as I love the Beatles, you know, a Beatles song. That's great. But mm -hmm. there, or whatever other song, you know, mm -hmm. uh, whatever other song you think is great that you love in your genre of music. Um, there is something about the mantra that it's almost like it's mystical. It's a mystical yeah. experience, at least for me, because it's like it touches you and it gives you the longing to be close to it, even though you don't understand. I'm speaking from my own experience, even though I don't mm -hmm. understand what it means. And then there comes this opportunity, if you want to take it, to learn more, like either to show up to more Kirtan concerts with your favorite artist because you just love them. And then it just open. it sounds like sort of that was what it was for you. Like it's an opening, it's an unfolding. And it's like when when you're ready, more and more keeps coming to you. And I just think that that's mm -hmm. so beautiful how you describe that in your own journey of meeting these different artists who clearly were starting to reveal things to you, which is, of course, mm -hmm. one of the acts of the divine is revelation. <laughs> so it's yes. really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you you touched on a few very, very important elements of this of this whole practice of bhakti yoga or the world of, or, or mantra shastra, like the, the signs of, of mantra. So we have, you know, the very powerful element called transmission. So are we actually in a relationship with, with a mantra that is alive? They call it Chaitanya, which is such a beautiful word. Or is the, is the mantra Jada? Is it like, you know, a nerd? And, um, and here teachers come into play. Like they are the ones who kind of pass on the torch and like, you know, um, um initiate or sometimes some 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 te teachers don't like that to you know that we say initiate but they kind of pass on them like they they hand you over the the mantra and and then also what happens what you've just been talking about is this beautiful synergy of music which is which is in a, a language of of emotion it's like expressed emotion and that in combination with the mantra um is just such a powerful door opener for so many people you know we we have like over and over we have people come to us who say like well i i don't actually i don't i didn't even know what mantras were but the music it just totally pulled me in and and i didn't really care if like you know to understand like i didn't care if i understood what you were singing about I, it just felt amazing and here you know like you were talking about that too and how how um, well Sanskrit is a is a non symbolic language, so meaning like the name, the name is the named. You know, like I said, the the earlier the the mantra is the sound body of the deity. So there's a direct contact with the deity through the Sanskrit language. You know, there there's um, I was like the analogy, like if I'm thirsty. I have to drink this in order to lo no longer be thirsty. I can't just say water <laughs> to, right. not, to not be so thirsty. But with the mantra, I can say the name over and over and it's there. There's no detour. You know, it's it's direct. Yeah, it's I love this because this is really the esoteric practice is un, uh, having the felt direct experience of mantra as deity it's the sonic body as you're saying of the deity and i think that that's very conceptual to 
a lot of people, maybe even our listeners, like, what the heck does that even mean? The sonic ah. body of that it is the deity. And um, I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit more, even, even if it is conceptual, it's like both uh, just for so that the listeners know, both Aliyah and I have the same teacher, Harish Wallace, who's a fantastic, like phenomenal teacher. Um, and he does talk about this, the, um, you know, the, the sonic body, but we have to be able to, and this is what I think Harish would say too, is you have to be able to grok the, the, the concept first sometimes like to intellectually understand it so that you can let go of that intellectual understanding as sort of like this map and then eventually let go of it so that you can have the direct felt experience. But sometimes it requires a little bit of conceptual knowledge. So I wonder if you could talk just for a moment about this really, you know, just mystical, esoteric understanding that the mantra is the sonic body of the deity. It is the deity. Mm. Yeah. Um, It's actually... I mean, controversial as it is, it is actually most easy to me to under to explain it in a dual way. Mm -hmm. Controversial because our teacher Harish uh, is a non-dual teacher, but um, what kind of made it more most tangible for me was him saying that the so the deities there are like different energy signatures of the of consciousness, and they are like angels in a way, and all of them like it's like they all have a different flavor a different flavor of consciousness and you know since sanskrit is a non-symbolic language we we access them directly by by saying their name by you know by addressing them in their name and that's like that's the sound body and i mean i also i also like how he says like we caress the sound body of the deity by chanting and mm-hmm. I mean, the non-dual approach would be to to not to not sort of place them outside of ourselves, to not address them, but actually realize, you know, we are we are all these different flavors of consciousness, all these different ener- um, energy signatures, and it's God or it's the goddess um, doing puja for the for the goddess, or it's it's God chanting for God and. Um, and maybe like one more word about the meaning of mantra. Um, I remember him saying that when it's a prayer, it's actually quite good if you know what you're praying for, if you want to know what you're praying for. So it's actually good to understand the words. So if you want to chant the, the Sri Agala Stotram, which I chanted at the beginning, make sure you know what you're, what you're, ta- what you're singing about. For example, there's like one verse where it's like, well, please give me a, a man. I want to get married. And I'm not, I'm not chanting that. <laughs> that verse, you know, on purpose. And and then on the other hand, there are other, there are other um, mantras where they have no semantic value. It's, it's basically just yay, God, yay, yay. Jay, right. Ram, Shri Ram, Jay, Jay, Ram, yay, God, yay, God, yay, yay, yay. Yeah, it's like a cell, just a, a celebration of the divine. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, I wonder what, for you in your experience of all these years this has been your path what are some of the biggest misconceptions that you find newbies or people in the festival culture have about mantra music about bhakti yoga um we'll just stick to yet the because just for our listeners so that you understand um aliyah earlier had mentioned bhakti yoga and bhakti yoga is just devotional yoga and and this can be prayer or music chanting um are two forms of bhakti yoga and we've just become very familiarized with bhakti yoga in the festival culture and kirtan but i'm sure there's a lot of misconceptions that you or myths that uh, people have that you come across and you have to be that myth buster. <laughs> so I'm curious yes. what this might be. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I kind of have a hard time being the myth buster, but 
I think it's very valuable as well because I, I remember how how liberating it was when my teachers pointed me to those when they actually burst the bubble and one of the big misconceptions is that you know it's all about devotion like no skill is necessary mm. and I believe it's a misconception or it's it's like a, a, a limit like a very limiting belief of or, or conception of what devotion actually is because for example tuning your guitar is also an expression of devotion <laughs> and um you know so i i just come across a lot um I, i've come across a bunch of <clears throat> paktas who um you know who kind of downplayed the whole skill element of of um of the practice and i mean my my teacher Ananda, she's she's very she's very savvy and very funny as well and she said well imagine imagine making love with your beloved you know you can you can have the greatest the, the greatest devotion on earth but if you rub on the wrong place like if you don't know the anatomy of your partner <laughs> yes this really is not really good much use. <laughs> yeah it's, oh, it's, it's not very pleasing to the ear i totally know what you mean because like i said my husband is a musician he plays tabla and um so the tuning of the instrument is so important so important in classical indian music that in the middle of a raga if they hear the instrument going out of tune they will stop wow. and tune in the middle of the raga and it becomes part of the entire devotional experience and um it's that important actually yeah. It, to what you're talking about, the skill, the 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 nuance, the subtlety of understanding that this gift that you're giving to the divine or that you're creating this relationship that you want to give them the best, right? The best mm -hmm. that you have. And so there's an awareness that skill and attention and attentiveness is important in the practice. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. The language, which, or did you want to say more about? No, no, no. Go ahead. Yeah. So language is the second big field of, of misunderstanding. So, you know, some people just think, well, it doesn't really matter if I pronounce Sanskrit right or wrong, but, uh, or, um, or if, or for, I mean, also I'm having a hard time talking about this, but anyway, um, also, like which language I sing in, you know, like for some people, a, a mantra is, is, is a, like an affirmation is a mantra. And, you know, according to the mantra shastras, that's, you know, that's just not true. And so with Sanskrit, and I, I can say this from my own experience as well, like the moment I learned it correctly from Anandra, a huge door opened and I was finally able to beforehand I had been reading about all these you know how people had such ecstatic experiences with mantras and I was like well every once in a while I'm like hit by grace and I feel that but it wasn't sort of it wasn't I didn't I didn't know how the door opened but then with Sanskrit um, with the correct Sanskrit pronunciation, it was like, I felt like I finally dialed into the right radio station. I had been sort of like, <laughs> kind of moving around the, the right frequency. And then I like, when I hit it, it was like, bam, okay, this is what you mean. Like now I can feel it. Yeah. That makes so, I wanna... so much sense. And I, I, I know that Harish, uh, talks about this exact same thing as well, how so many yoga is so popular in the West and especially here in the United States. Um, and yet you hear all these yoga instructors pronouncing Sanskrit words incorrectly, unknowingly, n not a yeah. bad thing or anything. But I think yeah. I'm, I'm curious about your experience of this, but this touches on the concept that a mantra can be inert or active or alive yeah and is it true that um a mantra needs to also be cor uh, correctly pronounced in order to be to become alive 
for you? Well, the analogy I like to use is, um, well, imagine you have a keyboard in front of you. You sit in front of a piano and you're trying to, to play a masterpiece. You have, you know, in, in front of you in, in, um, and the thing is, I mean, the masterpiece is, is, is this intricate arrangement of, of, of notes. But the problem is you, you only have, so see in, in Sanskrit, in the Sanskrit alphabet, we have 50 letters. In the Roman alphabet, we have 27, I believe, right? 26, 27, about 26, half, yeah. 26. We have about half of what there is in Sanskrit. So what happens often in the West, it's kind of quite literally, half of it gets, gets lost in transliteration, right? So that's that's the first problem. Like the mantras, they don't get here completely because of missing, di missing diacritics. And then we're trying to play this masterpiece, but we can only use half of the keyboard, right? We can only use 20, <laughs> 26 yes. keys oh instead gosh, of this 50. Is such a great analogy. I love it. Yes. Yeah. So it's like... It makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so... Now my mind is racing. I love this. So then for someone who's a newbie, like the festival goer, because I think a lot of people that will be watching this might be in that category. Um, how do they then know? How does someone know if the mantra is being uh, sung correctly? I mean, you go on YouTube and... I, I don't know, like I go on Spotify and I just put in Kirtan and, and what, like so many options come up. I go on YouTube and I type in mantra music or Kirtan. Again, so many options come up. And mm -hmm. how do you know that you're listening to something that is linguistically correct then? Like, what would you do if you were a beginner? Well, there are reliable sources. <laughs> You know, one one of them being the um, the videos that our teacher Harish made. So if you type in Christopher Harish Wallace and Mantra, I, I believe a bunch of them show up. Um, and they are there are artists who who have good Sanskrit skills, like Shantala, for example, Gina Sala, Pragnya Viera, to name just a few. And um, and and to see if the mantra is is Chaitanya for you, if it's alive for you, you will feel it. You will definitely feel it. Um, it, you know, it, if it seeks the relationship with you, so it will it will come to you in a very direct direct way. Um, and I I I always recommend finding a good teacher, like a good Sanskrit teacher. By now, there are a bunch of them out there, and and they can point you to other artists. Um, Harish always points us to what's her name, Gaia, but she has a longer oh, name. Yeah, as well. Gaia Sanskrit, Sanskrit. She's on YouTube. Um, and yes. what is good about her videos actually on YouTube is she always has the Sanskrit, you know, and then she has the what? What is it when it's uh, translated from Dianag? Uh, Dianagri. What's the? So, fun. so yeah, if you if you translate it from Devanagari. Or if you put Divinagri. it into, so Devanagari yes. is like the script. So you put it into like the Roman script. That's probably yes. what she does. Okay. She does. She does. Sometimes she does both of those. Okay. So, and then she, what she does, which is nice, is she chants very slowly. A lot of times in when you listen to um, YouTube videos, you'll find if it's by someone who's Indian, they chant it quite quickly. And you're like, wait, what? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> how do you pronounce that? But she's very yeah. intentional with how she, okay. she Great. chants. So um, she might, yeah, be a good source. And I'll put all these, yeah. uh, okay. these links good. in the um, show notes, but also of course you. <laughs> <laughs> and your music. Let's not forget Aaliyah here. <laughs> and her music. Well, I have I to, I have to say one. Sorry. Sorry. I, I um, I interrupted no, you. Go ahead. Because <laughs> I was getting shy. Um, I have to be completely, I want to be completely transparent. And up until I met my teacher, Anandra, my pronunciation was, it was good, but it was not 100% correct. So 
like if, when you listen to our albums, you know, there are a few little, um, yeah, a few little things in there. Now, think, thanks to Harish, who I studied Sanskrit with for a little bit, and Anandra, um, my, my pronunciation has gotten much better. But uh, yeah, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> enough of me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's it's very, you know, I think that that's, that's a really important piece. And Sanskrit is not easy. I know for me, um, I understand the importance of it. And I've always been someone that's horrible with language. My husband speaks fluent uh, Spanish uh, because he grew up in South America for the first part of his life. So he's bilingual and he's always telling me, oh, you should learn Spanish. It's so easy, which it is. But somehow my mind, or maybe I'm just too interested in other things. Um, so for me, I learn best by listening, not by understanding uh, the technical pieces, but literally just by monkey see, monkey do, listen to it, and then uh, imitate the sounds. But as you said, it's good to get a teacher and you bring up something in saying that, that I think is so important. And um, also our teacher talks about, which is that there's these things, these, these four things that are really, really important, which is the teacher and the teachings as well as the practice in the community. So there's these four pieces that are so important in our spiritual path. And for those people who might just like to go to a Jayu Tal concert or, you know, a Tina Malia concert um, here and there and think, oh, I got my, I got my vibes up. Like, <laughs> that's what I think when I sometimes go to these concerts. Um, it's like, I, I feel like they're missing these other important components. Like, that's great. This is the practice. This is part of the practice. But that practice has to be supported by a teacher, teachings, and community as well. And, and I don't your know own what your, Yeah, your own practice. Yeah, the community practice, but also your own practice. What is your... What is your personal practice um, when it comes specifically to um, to the music, to mantra? Well, um, it's interesting because as a community or as a you know as a kula, we receive so many teachings from from our teacher, from Harish. I mean, hundreds, hundreds of practices. And what always happens is I naturally gravitate towards all of the practices that have to do with mantra, like mantra re recitation, <laughs> all of them, all who have to do with the goddess. So out of these hundreds, I kind of stuck with about five, five mm -hmm. practices that I do every day. And they all have to do with like the invocation of a really ancient goddess mantra. And then I do mantra nyasa, which is moving a bija mantra up the, the, uh, the central channel. Um, and they're all, they're all Kali mantras or most of them. Um, that's, that's just my, that's just what I naturally gravitate to. And, um, and also Japa, I love doing Japa, the recitation of a mantra 108 times, or I mean, the classical tantra, it doesn't have to be 108. And, um, yeah, so they're mostly liberating practices. I remember we talked about this last time. So, um, you know, practices who, uh, um, so there, there are, you know, practices that liberate you or uh, practices that kind of invade, invite um, awakening. And um, yeah, and then musically, I mean, I have to be completely transparent. I, I am mostly an, an, an intuitive musician. I like right here next to me, there's an ancient piano from my grandfather. So what I usually do after my sadhana, I sit by the piano and I, and I practice playing mantras there, but I'm not very disciplined in a sense of like sitting down hours and hours and hours to play harmonium or um, it's usually just when, you know, when we compose something or when I learn a new mantra, that's when I'm active, active. that's when I spend 
um, a fair amount of time every day practicing. Yeah. Beautiful. What, um, I sort of want to pull this together by um, asking you what maybe advice or guidance would you give someone who, again, is maybe doesn't have a teacher, but is interested in bhakti yoga and mantra, like where would they start? What would be your recommendation? If you're going to start and you really want to explore this path, do this. What would be the first place to start? Wow. I mean, <laughs> if I speak to the the U.S. audience, um, you are very fortunate because you have a lot of super talented kirtanias who are also quite like deep in their practice, like who've had great teachers. So if I if I lived in the U.S., I would see okay, which which uh, mantra artist do I gravitate to and so I would listen to their music I would see if they offer any teachings if they do satsangs or or courses and and for example I mean I'm not I'm not too familiar with everyone but I can for example I can recommend um Sheila Bringi and Brent Kirker they do a great curriculum of like harmonium basics, Sanskrit, raga based kirtan. I always, of course, I always recommend my teacher Anandra. She's also a singer. Um, she is she's a classical Indian singer. She has she has her uh, in her music guru in India. Um, Harish doesn't do so much singing, but he's a phenomenal teacher when it comes to tantric philosophy um, and mantra shastra. So you know he's also a Sanskritist. Um, I mean, there are the people who I can say from the top of my head who also offer, who also do more than chanting on stage. Yes. Um, and I think that that's actually important, an important piece that they, mm -hmm. there's, there's a, they clearly have their own deep relationship and practice and teachings that they follow. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Wonderful. So how can people learn more about you? Uh, website, social media, you can actually put some of this stuff up on. Yeah, both. I mean, um, yeah, that's, that's my website. So we have a little bit of music on there. We have, we have a bunch of online teachings as well. Um, a few videos. I'm, I'm currently, I used to tour with the Love Keys for 10 years. So most of the YouTube videos, for example, are, um, I, from my former band. Um, and now I'm with my partner, Henning Huntelman, and we're, we're just about to get it all together. Like I'm moving out from the sort of the, the, the few years or month of sort of in between anyway. So it, it's all still building it's still a building up process, but I think the most alive connection would be on social media, Facebook or Instagram. And, okay. um, and that's also the most international way of, of, of being in touch. Like, cause I also post in English. Um, our main community is in, in Germany but um, we've traveled the whole world as the love keys. So I, I try to be as bilingual as, as possible. And if you want to listen to music, um, we are on Spotify. We are on YouTube. Um, all, almost all of our albums are on Spotify. We have nine albums. So you, you'll have a bunch to listen to. Yes. Um, cool. So for, for um, listeners that are not seeing what's on the screen right now, I'll just go ahead and say, um, so Aliyah's Instagram, Instagram is Aliyah, A-L-E-A-H dot Gandharvika, and that's G-A-N-D-H-A-R-V-I-K-A. -A. So Aliyah dot Gandharvika on Instagram, on Facebook, she's Aliyah Love Keys, all one word. And then finally, if you want to just check her out, her website is absolutely gorgeous. And she has a ton of her music there as well that you can listen to. Um, get a little sampling of, and that is at aliagandarvika.com. So again, A-L-E-A-H-G-A-N-D-H-A-R-V-I-K-A.com. Yes. 
So Aaliyah, it was so wonderful to have you on the podcast. Mm -hmm. I just, I love our conversation. I feel like I could keep going and going and going and, and probably would love to have you on again yes. <laughs> in the future to just to talk, talk more. It's, um, I think you're bringing such a wonderful gift into the world. Thank you for the work that you're doing and for the music that you're bringing and just the transmission. I know that you're bringing transmission, even though you're saying it, to, you know, maybe it's more in these past couple of years because you're pronouncing your, you're having a different relationship <laughs> with the mantras, but still it's, mm. it's so gorgeous. So thank you so much for your work. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for, for all you do. Thank you for this beautiful podcast. Yeah. You're welcome. And thank you everyone for joining us today and we'll see you next time. Namaste.